the room. So hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for being here. My name is Ayşegül Rosa Aksoy, a PhD candidate at Middle East Technical University and a research fellow at University of Chernak in Turkey. We are here today, uh, me and my colleague, Alex Tribing. Um, we are hosting this panel as new emerging scholars of Adapted Physical Activity Group from International Federation of Adapted Physical Activity. So thanks for being here as panelists and as a listener. And we hope this will help you for your future plans uh, if you are thinking about postdoc or something. And please do not hesitate to ask your questions uh, in the Q&A function or just jump in and ask your question uh, by yourself. Uh, there are some etiquettes. You already have it in the chat function, so I'm not going to rule on this. Uh, as I said that we are the co-chairs of the NESA, NESAPA, me and Alex, since uh, 2019. And I'm very happy uh, sharing this role with her, I must say. And we have um, Dr. David Beck with us here. Uh, he's the president of uh, IFAPA and past president of the Canadian Paralympic Committee. We would like him to say hello and yeah. The mic is yours, David. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rosa. And thank you, Rosa, to you and Alex uh, for hosting this and initiating this process and convening and overseeing the, the NASAPA uh, committee or collective. Uh, it's a fantastic initiative, one that I'm very supportive of, one that I'm very pleased to see that's emerged in the last couple of years. And I'm, I regret that I'm not able to stay for the presentation. My sincere apologies. But I did want to come on and say hello and to say specifically to the two of you, thank you uh, for taking on this leadership opportunity. And to the other speakers that are on the panel, thank you uh, for participating and for guiding and for leading. And I hope those that are joining and listening in that you're able to, to garner some connections uh, to network with some like-minded colleagues and to further develop uh, your relationship with um, people in adaptive physical activity. So again, I apologize that I'm not able to stay Rosa and Alex, but congratulations and thank you very much for doing this and I hope the session goes well. Thank you. You're welcome. Goodbye. Bye. Thank Have you. a good Goodbye. day. We will send you the recording. <laughs> thank you. And uh, let's go. Thanks, David, for, for welcoming the event. Uh, let's go to our panelists. I will just say their names very quickly uh, and they will introduce themselves and they will tell about their postdoc experience. Of course, this is why we are having this. So the first um, panelist is Dr. Emily Moon. Uh, she's postdoctoral researcher at the moment. And then we will have Dr. Ryan Halton. Then we have uh, Nicole Kirk, Dr. Nicole Kirk. Also, she was uh, past um, student rep for IFAPA, and we will have Dr. Kvok, and she has a lot of, he, sorry, he has a lot of hats. He is vice president of the IFAPA, he is a uh, postdoc, he has a lot of roles in IFAPA, and uh, also as an SAPA chairs, we are uh, co-working with him under his supervision, and thanks for all the support so far. And then we will have uh, Dr. Alex driving, uh, who is also one of the hosts, actually. So I would like to stop my share, uh, screen sharing. And we would like to give the microphone to Dr. Emily Moon, please. Good morning or good afternoon, wherever you are. I'm Emily Mine, um, just to describe myself. Uh, I have uh, long brown hair. I'm wearing a green sparkly sweater with my blue light glasses on. Um, and I'm sitting on my couch because I'm sick and working from home. So I'd like to apologize for having very little voice at the moment. Um, but I'm at the University of South Carolina. I graduated from my PhD with Auburn this past August. Um, and I've been working uh, in exercise science and physical activity, specifically with special populations. Um, I have my master's degree in special education, which kind of brought me into this world. And yeah, that's my quick introduction. 
I'm Ryan Holtine. Just a quick description. I have short brown hair, uh, multicolored glasses, and a light blue dress shirt on. Uh, I am currently an assistant professor in the School of Kinesiology at Louisiana State University, but prior to accepting that position, I was a postdoc at two different universities, one at the University of British Columbia in Canada and the other at uh, Australian Catholic University in Sydney, Australia. So I have a bit of um, kind of international postdoc experience, um, as well as my PhD studies, which were done in Australia as well. I think I'm maybe supposed to go next. Hi, my name is Nicole Kirk. Um, I am currently an assistant professor at the University of Georgia. Quick description of myself, I also have short brown hair, I'm also wearing glasses, and I'm also wearing a collared shirt. Mine is gray and has blue dots. Um, uh, what else? So I'm an assistant professor at the University of Georgia, so the uh, Southeastern Conference is being well represented in this particular panel today. Um, uh, before that, I was a postdoc at the University of Michigan for about one year. Um, and then before that, I got my uh, doctoral degree at Old Dominion University in Southeastern Virginia. Hi there, my name is Dr. Kwok Ng. Um, so a description of me is that I've got black hair. I um, have, uh, my origins are from Asia. And uh, so my skin is, is a little bit um, darker. And I'm wearing a uh, blue pullover jumper with a set of headphones and a microphone. Uh, so, um, well, yeah, I did my PhD over at Uvascular, University Uvascular in Finland. And then after that, I did some postdoc roles in um, Queen's University, Palatka University, and then uh, for extended more extended periods of time at uh, University of Limerick and University of Eastern Finland. And now I'm senior researcher in University of Eastern Finland, as well as University of Turku. So these two are both in Finland and I continue to work at University of Limerick. Um, and, uh, and of course, as Rosa mentioned, I'm also the vice president of the International Federation of Adaptive Physical Activity, as well as the European Federation of Adaptive Physical Activity. I also have a nine-year-old daughter, and, uh, and I currently live in Finland. Thanks, Kwok. Hi, everyone. I am Dr. Alex Stribbing. I have brown hair. It's currently slicked back in a bun. I am wearing glasses with a blue Kane University polo, and I am sitting in my office with a virtual background of the university. And I am currently an assistant professor at Kane University. It is my very first year, second semester. Before this, I did a two-year postdoc at the University of South Carolina. And then prior to the postdoc, I did my PhD also at the University of South Carolina in physical uh, education and adapted PE. And then Rosa, I think it's back to you. Yeah, uh, thanks for, for this round to um, let your introduce yourself to our listeners. And I just noticed that I forgot to also describe myself. So <laughs> I am just standing in my study room in front of the PC and I have long hair over my shoulders um, around my 40s. And uh, yeah, I, I am from Turkey. So yeah, that's it from me. So I would like to start uh, with some, like we, we can, we would like to hear your experience actually around some some questions. So I would like to start like, why did you choose to take a position as a postdoc? Why did you go in that direction? So whoever feels like uh, just jumping in, unmute yourself, please. And then we can start with this, why you wanted to do your postdoc. I can go first. Um... So I did my PhD at Auburn University and finished up in exercise science. Um, and I was really lucky during that time there. Um, and so was my boss in one sense that all of our funding came from donations. 
Um, so I hadn't done anything with large scale grant work or writing grants. I had very little experience. And for me, moving, wanting to moving into a faculty position, I wanted to work and have experience writing and working on um, large grants just as a trajectory. It felt like the missing gap in my training. Um, and so I sought out postdoc positions that would give me the opportunity to work on and be a part of writing large scale grant pieces. So that's kind of where my motivation for a postdoc position came from. I'll chime in as well. I think uh, to me, there's a couple of things with doing a postdoc. So number one, I think it's always sort of pitched as it's an opportunity to gain some new different type of skill or get a different set of training than you may have gotten at um, in your former degrees and things like that. So um, certainly that was the case for me in my two postdocs, um, learning to work on like large school-based interventions. So, you know, uh, I went from doing it, my own dissertation of collecting data on about 100 people to running a 16 school intervention with well over 1000 participants and certainly a steep learning curve, but um, I feel pretty capable of handling kind of large scale projects. So that's kind of one thing. Number two, I think, depending on where, if you're if you're thinking about sticking in academia and you, at least in the US, you want to work at a larger research institution, a postdoc is often seen as kind of like one of the checkmark things that you need to have um, to kind of move along in that process. Um, and uh, number three, I think, for me, the best thing about doing a postdoc, honestly, was just having time to get out of the mindset of just my dissertation, because that just, you know, when you're in that phase, it consumes all of your time and your thoughts. And it's really hard to think about any other project outside the scope of your dissertation. So having those postdoc years really allowed me to kind of really take some time to think about where I wanted to take my career next and what types of projects I wanted to pursue outside of just my dissertation so that when I got a faculty position, ultimately, I, I, I more clearly understood who I was and what I wanted to do in that role. Piggybacking off of what this is Nicole Kirk, uh, piggybacking off of what the other two folks said before me, I think my my reasons were twofold. First was again to gain uh, some experiences that I hadn't gotten as a as a doctoral student. Things like grant writing, things like collecting different types of data or learning new methodology uh, were certainly in my mind. But in addition to that, uh, you know, honestly, it was a pragmatic decision. I wanted to be at a research institution ultimately. Uh, so in, R, in the United States, you know, R1 or an R2, uh, rather than a more teaching oriented institution. And at the time when I was graduating and going on the job uh, hunt, the offers that I got were for teaching institutions. And so I don't know how true this is, but the advice had commonly been, don't go to a teaching institution and then try to return to a research institution. That's gonna be really difficult to do uh, as a faculty member. Again, I don't know if that's actually true or not, but that's the advice that I was given. And so with that in mind, I thought, well, if my only options for jobs right now are to go to teaching uh, focused institutions, and ultimately I wanna end up at a research institution, I should probably look for other options. And so, uh, University of Michigan was uh, had just had a couple of postdocs who had transferred into university or faculty positions, so there were uh, some openings available, and so I decided to take advantage of that so I could continue to be research facing. Yeah, so I don't know. It's a uh, situation for for me is a little bit different, but same kind of reasons, I suppose, in terms of going to continue academic. However, I think the concept and the term of postdoc is quite an interesting one from the universities I've been to. So I think most places we've heard from Emily, Ryan, Nicole, that the postdoc is like a stepping stone towards uh, towards uh, university doing research. <clears throat> um, but um, 
actually in some some countries as well postdoc is actually just anything that you do as a researcher that is postdoctoral hence the term postdoc and um and so therefore you can be an associate professor and then go to become a postdoc and which is kind of great because you just don't need to do all the teaching or any of the other admin stuff you just work on research so from that perspective it's it's uh it's been really nice because of my phd i had also responsibilities to do teaching and uh, start working on some curriculum design and and other admin work of course not to the same degree as to to uh what you know, professors would do, but uh, taking up the f the first long term postdoc, where there was uh, no requirement for teaching and just working on research was 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 really nice to to do. So I think it really depends on which country you go to, which institute you go to, and um, and then see what what they mean by postdoc as well. And if it's under this four stage career process that uh, that we also talk about now. Um, then yeah, it is. It can be a stepping stone. So uh, so yeah, motivation wise, if you want to be in research, then uh, then um, then that might be one one of the steps. I think it's very rare to just jump straight from PhD to then um, some some other positions because there's just so many other people and so many other things that needs to be done uh, to 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 develop your skills beyond just what you do on your PhD. Hi everyone, this is Alex. Um, so for me, and just like everybody else, it was to gain the experience. At the University of South Carolina, the PhD program is just a very fast three years. And prior, com prior to going to South Carolina, I had no research experience at all. I did not do a, a thesis. I did essentially a systematic review. And um, so, Doing a three-year PhD, we did a lot of teaching, really only focused on the dissertation and some other projects that our advisor was, was doing at the time. And so once, right before I was graduating with my PhD, I felt that I needed the, the research experience. Um, I was confident in collecting data, um, but it was more so the analyzing, the writing, all those other steps. And so that's why I decided to uh, stay at the University of South Carolina and uh, do a postdoc position. The, the university I'm at right now, it it's historically been a teaching university, um, but we're cur currently moving to an R2 research status. And that's kind of like middle of the road. And for me, that is, is, is perfect for what I want to do and what I want to accomplish research-wise and teaching as well. So that's a little bit about why I chose to go into a, a postdoc position right after my PhD program. Great, thanks. Actually, uh, from that point, what I hear is, uh, of course, everybody has their own different reason, but they have, uh, you, you already told that the situation in your country and also in the, uh, the, the, the conditions in the academia where you are living, I guess this is also kind of forcing you or like opening a way, a road in front of you that you you may need to go to the uh, for the postdoc. So from that point, maybe I would like to ask like uh, how would you describe like um, how it differs in the United States and in Europe? What would you like to say from your own experience and also if you have uh, some some knowledge, some information about this? Rosa, can you like rephrase that question? Are you asking us to describe like what a day looks like in a postdoc position or are you asking differences between US and other countries? Like you can actually go for both. Like you can explain like how it's going, uh, like your daily routine, how was it? And also how it differs from country to country or continent to continent. Maybe we can also open this part a little bit. I, I can hop in and at least speak to maybe, I mean, um, 
I did, po- so I did two postdocs, one in Australia, one in Canada. Realistically, my kind of day to day in terms of what I was expected to do, both postdocs were, I was brought in specifically to run a particular project, right? So the way I always view the postdoc is um, there's the main projects typically that you're kind of brought on for, and that needs to be your focus and your emphasis day to day. At the same time, you're trying to use that postdoc experience as a way to advance your career as well. So when you're when you have free time that's not focused on the project you've brought been brought in for, it should be focused on trying to get other publications or starting other work, developing those skills like the grant writing, things like that. Um, just from a slight different, I guess, like international sense, um, the Canadian system at least is, I would say, very similar to the U.S. system, kind of how postdocs in the U.S. would work. Australia is a bit different um, just in that uh, the PhD system in Australia is set up differently where there's almost no, there's essentially no coursework that's done and you're solely focused on completing research from basically day one of your PhD. So the market in Australia is particularly competitive, I would say more so than even um, the US and in Canada. And so if that is a particular system that you're trying to break into, it can be really hard because most people coming out of their PhDs in the Australian system are coming out with a minimum of six first author publications and closer to 10 overall publications in the four years that they've done their PhD. Um, So that's just one kind of difference I've noted. This is Nicole. Um, I can't really speak to any particular differences across continents because mine was in the U.S., which is also where I completed my uh, all of my education. Um, so I don't have a, a frame of reference for comparison, but I can say that my postdoc was probably very different from most. Uh, as Ryan mentioned, most postdocs are brought in to work on a project or a, you know, a menu of projects that the lab is working on during that time. You may be doing independent research or semi-independent research on uh, projects that are of interest to you on top of that. Um, I think that's how my postdoc would have worked had I done it uh, two or three years before. But I was in a somewhat unique position in that the PI um, principal investigator for my lab was about ready to retire. And as such, uh, he had some funding, grant funding, uh, his entire lab was grant funded, had some funding left over to burn through, um, but a project that was basically wrapping up. And so I was in a very unique situation in that I kind of was able to do pretty much whatever I wanted to do as a postdoc. So I kind of just worked with my PI to set some goals for you know, different projects, different uh, areas that I wanted to improve. And so I think the big things that we were doing were getting my dissertation manuscripts published, which was a pretty easy first first few months project to get off the ground, but really something that if you go directly from a doctoral program to a, a faculty appointment can be really tough because you're also then doing your first run of course preps. You're doing Uh, You might be getting teaching evaluations, you might be having service obligations and things like that, that postdocs generally don't have to deal with. So it was really nice to have a a kind of a free span of time to to get these things done and out the door. Then after that, I was able to do some other, uh, we worked on a couple of projects that I wanted to get off the ground. They were all ultimately hampered by the pandemic, but they all did get started. Um, And then in addition to that, I was able to write two foundation grant applications when I was there, which was uh, really good practice for moving forward. It's not at all the same as writing like a big uh, government funded grant, but it is it was a huge stepping stone for me in terms of learning how to write grants. Um, And so that's basically what I did. I imagine I'm probably the only person who was kind of given that kind of free reign to just do whatever, but it was also really flexible, which I appreciated. This is Emily speaking. Um, I'm only four, five months in, um, so we're a little fresh postdoc here. Um, I also can't speak to a uh, difference in country. I've been, been in the U.S. for all my academic career as well, um, but I came in kind of in an interesting situation, which is late on a grant. 
Um, so the postdoc prior to me, which was not Alex, but I didn't take her job. Um, I took Lainey's job. And so I came in on the back half of a specific grant, which meant I was coming in after we had kind of done most of the methods and jumping into kind of a statistical analysis and write-up situation. Um, and then also that next step, which was what I was looking for, was you know, coming into the writing. And so for me, day-to-day -day, um, postdoc has kind of been, um, it ebbs and flows with the grant cycle and public citation process. So for a lot of mine, I actually have been able to do split and have write-ups and analysis for the work that is on the grant and then also publishing a lot of what my dissertation and getting that data out that I had um as it ebbs and flows through through the cycles of you know applying for our next grant and, and the rushed up to do that um and then kind of slow back down and I'm either writing up the data that we're working on from the previous grant or writing up the stuff from my dissertation and that's so my day-to-day -day kind of sits in that cycle uh yeah so first of all I'd kind of MV, MV Nicole's situation of uh, having that uh, freedom to do things. I think uh, I have a more similar experience to Ryan in the sense that uh, there was a project, a fixed project to work with. Um, in the in one of the postdocs that I worked with, um, I, I, I made, um, as I made a transition from Ireland back to Finland, I made a, um, I made a, a split job situation. So it, it it kind of meant that I stayed within the project and continued to manage it, very similar to what Ryan was saying, whole school so, um, type of interventions, uh, lots of thousands of kids, and uh, and it's quite a long term, and I still work on that project, but I don't do it full time. So then there's other work which I also do, which obviously can't be full time as well, um, but um, but it was, it's, shall I say, it's, um, it, it it allowed me to really focus on what type of areas needed my personal development in. So in the PhD, what was nice in the program in Uvascular is that we had um, a, a personal development plan that you we kind of like looked at. What do you want to do? Where do you want to go? How do you want to do it? And within those types of plans, we had our supervising team, but we also had an independent supervisor just to make sure that the faculty is able to help you with that plan. And if not, then we seek other avenues. So that might be through partnerships with other universities, or it might be uh, you know, a, a visit somewhere else where they didn't have the equipment or the expertise, et cetera, et cetera. So um, from that process, it's it's been uh, uh, going to Limerick. We also had a personal development plan as well, and again, trying to identify training needs. And HR usually has has done this to identify, you know, how many people in the university need a certain type of training. Um, it could be statistics, or it could be soft skills, or it could be lecturing or supervision. So one of the things that I started to realise was that uh, I I didn't get much experience in supervising, and I had. Some of the best supervisors, in my opinion, best supervisors for PhDs, and so I wanted to carry that on. So I I got the experience of learning to to be what to understand what a supervisor would be in the Irish context, and the Irish context is very different from the the Finnish context, as well as in in other countries that I now do supervisions with, um, and um, so it's it's it's. I don't know. I, I should I say it's again. It's still you know I, that there's not the need for for the lecturing admin stuff in under the postdoc. So it's been quite nice to look at what one wants to do, and in this way, um, I was able to to identify that and then work towards that and find the time. I find it to say that this is the amount of percentage of time that I need to spend to work on that, and then hopefully I would be able to spend the time on that. So then. Um, all the other work, which would have been research outputs, whether they're publications, fundings, reviewing, or whatever else, um, would be would be appropriate to that amount of time. And then the rest of it is for my own personal development. So that's that's kind of nice in in that regards. And um, yeah, um, and I've had the support from the two universities to do that. It's now three universities. 
to do that. It's a little bit, it's more challenging now with three universities, I have to say, but that's maybe for another discussion. So uh, daily life right now, it depends um, which day I'm working on for which institution, because it's different for each institution. Hi everyone, it's Alex. Um, so just to keep it very short so we can move on to the next question and learn more from all of these experts. Um, I ran a parent-child physical activity intervention and at, at as my postdoc at the University of South Carolina, it was off of a, a foundation grant that is just primarily in the uh, Carolina, Carolina, sorry, can't talk. Um, and so that program only went for one week per month. And so during that week, I would go to the early childhood center. I would run an hour intervention for the parents and the children. And then I'd go home and I'd start preparing for the next day and also the next month and what skills we were gonna focus on. Um, so essentially my postdoc was running an intervention for parents and their preschool age children. And then after outside of that, then like, Everybody else kind of said we. I was able to start working towards publishing my dissertation um, and working on other research, whatever whatever came my way. Um, but I also was able to take on an additional class. So I was able to teach um, I, motor learning. I taught the motor learning course at University of South Carolina. Um, but that was a side from the, the postdoc. And that was because I wanted to kind of stay in the teaching mode and mindset. So I also took on one course to teach aside from my, my postdoc research. Thanks for this answer, Stu. Uh, it's, um, at that moment, I would like to ask the audience if they want to ask any question, they can also jump in or write their questions in the chat function. Please feel free. Uh, do not uh, feel shy. <laughs> we have ex excellent panel here. They are all experienced from different places. So it's a nice chance to ask your own questions as well. Uh, from that point, I actually would like to ask Alex if uh, she has a question as a, also as a co-host of this event. Maybe she would like to ask something to, uh, to the panelists. Sure. So, sorry, I had to go back to my list. Um, I guess my question is, what should you consider when choosing a postdoc position? Is there something that should stick out to you when applying for a position? Or maybe if you're writing your own grant to be a postdoc, what is something you look for um, to be a postdoc, I guess? Um, I'll just jump straight in at the moment. I think for in my situation after my PhD or towards the end I just applied to a ton of postdocs that just seemed to be in the field that I could work in like I did go into um what is it it's like uh, sociology of sport because that was a bit out of my area but I would go into something more in the areas that I can feel fulfill like uh, adaptive physical activity um health promotion um physical education and uh, there was a ton ton of applications i mean and at the same time you know it, it was uh, being flexible and being willing to see where one wanted to go to like a place i didn't look at all was in the uk and um and the reason for that was brexit so um yeah i mean you know i i knew where not to go and uh, but i was open to to apply for anything else possible so um it was whoever would take me really <laughs> um, i don't know that that's a fortunate for them or not um for me i you know i had that set of skills i wanted to learn i also wanted to stay within a range of like my focus so i had worked a lot with autistic individuals individuals with down syndrome um but i wanted to stay obviously on the adaptive side, um, there's a lot of more opportunities outside of adaptive, but that was a, a key for me um, with staying where there's 
a, a mix of both, but has the adaptive piece as well. And so I would say like a huge thing to consider is, are you wanting to stay so directly in your line? Or are you willing to find those skills in an adjacent line um, to help you progress? And, and there's no wrong answer there. I think both uh, give their give good opportunities. Um, I wanted to be in a, like somewhere close, but enough adjacent. And so I've been able to do the more visual impairment work since then and have been able to open a, a different skill set that wasn't even on my list by being willing to step kind of out of the autistic community and those with Down syndrome um, into a, di a different population that I'm serving and working with um, that has expanded that that space as well. So that's a huge thing. I also would say um, don't underestimate who that boss is going to be and figure out and make sure it's someone that you not only can professionally work with, but you like, um, you, which is always the truth. That's, and that's what I would say for any type of movement, whether it's a mentor, um, for a PhD going from a master to a PhD or going on to a job, make sure those people around you, um, are likable and making your work setting, uh, a more enjoyable place to be. Um, and then for me, one of my big ones that I don't know, it's on everyone's list. I didn't want to be the only postdoc. Um, a lot of people get on their postdoc island and you're it. It's just you and you would have to seek out postdocs in completely different departments of the university or, and, and, and sometimes if you're, you can be unlucky and to not even find that. So one of the things I was seeking out is places where other people were at the same place in their career as me. Um, so I wouldn't be on my little island alone. And every place I applied and looked at uh, had more than one postdoc within that lab or at least a postdoc within an adjacent lab um, within their department. I think uh, one of the things that's important to remember with postdocs, or I guess to me, the weird part about doing a postdoc is the process for getting them is is kind of weird um because like to me there's kind of it boils down to basically there's three kind of different ways that you can get a postdoc so one is you can just apply for positions that are out there now that can sometimes be the hardest because you're probably putting in an application with a ton of other people um number two how i actually got both my postdocs was through connections that i made either with the supervisor or my supervisor from the PhD had previously worked with the person who eventually was my boss in the postdoc. So at least in that sense, when it's through kind of a, a mutual connection, you can understand more about who it is you're going to be working with, what type of lab they run, different things like that. The third option um, and is, is kind of the best position to be in and, it, and in some ways the hardest is if you can come with your own funding or even just partial funding and then try and seek out people. So um, during my second postdoc, I was able to apply for um, a health research organization, um, like a funding mechanism through that, where I basically brought in uh, about half of my salary. So it was much easier to make the case then for someone to bring me on because they were only having to give kind of 50% of funding um, so just, I guess, realizing that there's a lot of different ways and it's a real gift to be able to have a lot of different choices and options, I think, with your postdoc. This is Nicole again. I'm going to be honest. I, I so far down the list of people who responded to this question that I kind of forgot what the STEM question was. Um, but, uh, <laughs> I would like to say, uh, that I think it was about how we're, what you consider when you're thinking about choosing a postdoc, something like that. Right. So uh, I think as everyone has noted thus far, it's really different depending on where you are. So Kwok talked about filling out many applications in like a formalized fashion, Ryan, you talked about kind of three different paths, which are formal or less formal. And I think at least in the United States, for the most part, um, they tend to be gotten through connections more so than perhaps doing, uh, 
you know, kind of finding some repository of, of applications or open postdoc positions. And that was how mine was as well. So uh, I, my uh, doctoral advisor was aware of this opening that had just happened before it had even been kind of posted to, I'm sure it eventually went out on like a father's Twitter and, uh, you know, Nick Feed's Twitter, which is an American organization and Nuff Office Twitter and all those sorts of things. I think that it, it eventually went out through those, but I happened to hear about it before any of that happened. So I was already in contact with them before it had gone public, so to speak, which is really different than like hiring for faculty positions or things of that nature for the most part, which are at least in the United States, highly formalized, right? There's a way that it's done. Calls have to go out. You have to entertain pretty much all applicants. Postdocs are at least in my experience, much less consistent with how they're sourced, how they're uh, applied for, how they're funded, et cetera. So um, yeah, so mine was, I just kind of happened to hear about this option and kind of said, hey, I'll, I'll do that. So it wasn't wasn't formal at all. I kind of wandered into it. But uh, you know, what should you consider? I think is obviously availability is really uh, key because you can't apply for things that don't exist or you can't, you know, you can ask, you can certainly contact people and see what's out there and you you may need to, but, you know, pretending for a second that you have an embarrassment of riches and there are many, many postdocs of interest, I would say the things you might want to target are mentors that you're interested in working with or learning from who, who would round out your skill set. We've talked about that a lot so far, right? Um, in addition to that, you know, who would be someone whose work you are interested in learning more about? So it would be great if it rounded out your skill set, but if it's not of interest to you or your professional goals, it kind of doesn't matter. And then um, I would say, you know, where can you kind of see a postdoc helping you? So a postdoc is meant to help bridge that gap for most people between doctoral programs and a full-time faculty or research, other researcher positions. So if it's a, a postdoc that you don't see furthering your career goals, then it's probably not going to be all that useful for you. So those would be the things I might think about considering if I had it, if I did it in a more, uh, uh, a less haphazard way than I did. Yeah, and to, fi to finish off this question, it it's for me, it was the connection and relationship that I built with my PhD advisor, who was then who I was funded with um, for my postdoc, Dr. Allie Bryan at the University of South Carolina. Um, so I think the big one for me is can, like Emily said, can you work with your postdoc boss or advisor, whatever you want to call them, um, and the interest? Um, can they? give you that experience that you are wanting to get out of your postdoc. Um, during a postdoc position, um, I firmly believe that you are the driver of your of your own train. So you're going to get out of it what you put into it. And that's something that I definitely gained um, from doing a postdoc and choosing to stay at the University of South Carolina with my PhD advisor. Yeah, I should probably make just one comment about this so in Finland there was a there was this issue whereby if you were to get the the, the national grant funding the Finnish Academy there was a, a regulation to say that you could not apply for that unless you were outside your research institute where you did your PhD so this is whereby the the formal applications had to go by because of course you know I would have loved to have stayed in uvascular and still and worked there for for continually but they, they it would have meant that we wouldn't be able to get up at the opportunity for the funds and this was highlighted in the in the uh, development plan early on in the PhD that I mentioned earlier so yeah I mean it's it, it is quite different in that regards and uh, but you know that the the ironic thing about that reg that rule for that application is they threw it out the window last year so it's like I put myself out into the ocean out on a boat and then it's like I'm waiting to cast back to the shore and I don't know where I'm heading off to uh, but it's been wonderful and it's a great uh, great experience so far yeah thanks for for the answers and uh, from that point, I uh, just would like to point uh, that there's a nice discussion uh, in the chat, actually. Uh, Priscilla Barfaldi Bittar, she's from Brazil and um, actually asked a nice question, two questions. 
And Ryan already answered, but I also would like to point it out loud. So maybe you would like to add something. So uh, her post says, I still haven't finished my master's. And when I finish, I intend to continue my studies in another country. I'm from Brazil. Do you have any tips? And the second question actually, and second and third question, what about the timing? When is the good time for applying for the postdoc? And uh, there was also another question, like uh, if there is a website or some like online resources that you can check for the postdoc positions, if you would like to go and say something about those points. Um, on the site situation, uh, my best advice that I got for while uh, seeking out postdoc was, who are you citing? Um, so not necessarily Googling postdocs positions, but actually going, who am I citing in my papers? And then taking that and going to like a grants.gov or whatever and looking to see if they have funding that funds a postdoc. And even beyond that, every person I've reached out to has been so kind um, in my process. And so I just started cold emailing and saying who I was, the research I did. I had a, a formal CV that was checked before I even sent the first email. And I cold emailed and said, hey, this is what I do. If I had met them before, I told them where I had met them and like kind of reminded like where our connection came from and just said, I'm looking for a postdoc position. Do you have one? And so it kind of goes back into having those connections. But even if you're in a situation, you're like, well, I haven't met, I've been a COVID doc student. We've not met anyone. I haven't had that networking situation. If you're citing them in your papers, you can say that. You can say, hey, this is the work I do. And, you know, I, my dissertation is based, you know, partially off of blah, 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 this citation of yours. And I really am interested in the work you're doing and I'm seeking out postdoctoral position. Do you currently have funding for a postdoc or do you know someone in the related field? And I've, I asked that to probably 10 or 20 people and I was able to have so many people, even if they didn't have one themselves, they were sending me information on who might have one um, in the same line of research. And that kind of led me to, and I ended up with, you know, three options when it came time to pick one. Um, and I never once looked it up on a website. I was just going through that cycle uh, and process. So that would be my advice is who are you citing? And, you know, if you're citing papers from 19 something, you're probably not going to have as much luck. But if you, if your, if your citations are from recent years, and this is the line of research that is constantly continuing, those people are probably getting funded and your site and, and you can move forward and, and walk through that path for it. Yeah, this is Nicole again. I'd like to say I think uh, that's great advice that Emily gave and Ryan has made some great additions in the chat as well or recommendations in the chat as well. Um, I'm going to handle that first question from Priscilla or attempt to anyway, because I think the advice is actually really similar to what Emily has just said about reaching out to people. So uh, Advice I was given early on in the, you know, we're kind of talking about two different things with postdocs and doctoral programs, but they are often similar. And so uh, not the programs themselves, but the way you kind of find them. Uh, advice I was given early on in the process of trying to find a doctoral program was to email a lot of people. Uh, because yes, you can email that one person that you think is going to be your dream mentor and like, that's what you want, but there's a numbers game that goes with this, right? If that person who's your dream mentor happens to be full up on doctoral students for now or just isn't going to be able to accommodate you in the time frame that works for you, uh, you know, it's it's a good idea for you to have multiple potential mentors to talk to. So if you are interested, I would start uh, looking at, like Emily said, look at your citations or look at current, uh, you know, current research is being done, even if it's not something that you're citing, right? So if you look at APAC, Adapted Physical Activity Quarterly, um, Disability and Health, Disability and Rehabilitation, Sport Education and Society, there are a number of journals that you can look at where people are working in these topical areas that may be of interest to you. 
And then you can start to reach out and see where are these people working? Do they have, could they potentially have doctoral uh, positions available, right, for PhD students? Um, and then talk to a few of them. It's very different, I think, for most people who, at least in the United States, have gone through the undergraduate and even master's program uh, pipeline, which is like you apply before you've ever met a person or talked to a person, you put in an application to be an undergraduate student at whatever university, or maybe you put in a, a, a you know, a master's application. We get them all the time here at UGA where students have not reached out to us personally. They just apply, right? They did a P, uh, an undergraduate degree in health and physical education or a related field. And so then they just apply to a master's program and we take them on the basis of their application materials. PhDs are quite a bit different uh, in my experience, which is it's really about the bond between you and your mentor. So it's really important that you seek out a few different people and talk to them via phone, Zoom, email, anything that you can to try to see if, first of all, they have a position, if your interests are aligned with theirs, if your approach aligns with theirs. And then anytime you're adding an international component to it, if you're planning on going abroad, you need to double check and make sure that they're able to take students from an international background. Certain universities can, at least in the United States, certain universities can't. And so it may not be a you thing, it may just be a fit thing that they're not able to take students from out of state or out of country. And certain granting mechanisms, uh, at least in the United States, have to answer to that as well. Like I have a grant right now that I can only take students from the United States or students who are permanent residents in the United States. It has nothing to do with any other qualifications. It's just the granting mechanism that kind of has us uh, bound to that group of people. Um, so yeah, talk to people, cold email everybody. That's really the best advice that I can give. Just to quickly piggyback on that, um, I think this is probably all of y'all's experience as well. Being in adaptive physical activity, I've never had a bad reaction to my emails. Even if it's a no, people in this field are super kind and they're they're going to be kind in their response, even if they can't help you. So don't have a lot of anxiety. I had so much anxiety when I came in and literally 20 emails later of cold calling essentially. And I, I, I zero negative reactions. So people are really helpful in this field. And even if they don't have something themselves, they do like to, to continue our work and push this field forward. And that means producing good postdocs and PhDs. Yeah, I'd just like to echo this in terms of it's a skill of networking and particularly for uh, for for doing things online. Of course, you get the opportunity to meet people in conferences. You can have a chat with them and speak to professors that you might have cited. And uh, I remember one one conference we had uh, Claudine Cheryl there and everybody was so excited that we get the opportunity to meet her in person and things. And it was uh, uh, on one hand, you know, anxiety on the other hand, you know, really grateful um, to be able to speak to someone and then figure out what to do, not at least just to find out what to say and then to figure out if one would want to do some research or opportunities there. And I suppose there's other characters out there that people may also aspire to try to work with as well. So get in contact with them for sure. Uh, PhD programs, I think, is, uh, yeah, it depends on the countries, it depends on the funding streams, depends on how much it costs and whether overseas it costs more or not. And, uh, you know, in, in some places in Europe, it's it's a fraction of the price as it is in, in, in the States. So it uh, can be a little bit um, uh, financially more viable in that regards, um, but also um, in the sense that there are therefore more applicants in a sense that so for us in Ireland we have to have an application process and um, and same same in Finland as well and um, and certainly in the UK so I think um, you know funding mechanisms is one thing you know you, we all need to have a house over our head it might not pay the most but it's certainly rewarding if you are really passionate about the research question that's been asked uh, answered and um, and so yeah I um, if you're if you're willing to to go through that, I would strongly advise. I, I would highly advise that you go ahead and and chase your dreams. Find out what your dreams are and go chase them and find out ways to do that. Um, so yeah, I mean, um, 
uh, that's, and then, then after that, the next step go forwards, um, you know, stay in connection with the network, stay in connection to see other people may have known other opportunities. And, um, and uh, if you're prepared to be flexible and to move around, then that's wonderful. Um, uh, and hope to see you along the way and hear where you're at now. That's the, that's that, that would be from, from my experience. Thanks for the answers again. And I um, we are coming to end of our time, so I uh, would like to ask if you if you have something to add, like as a last tip, uh, last word from the panelists. Like, or maybe I can ask uh, if you would like to give a tip uh, to new applicants. What would you do differently when you start your postdoc that you notice when you finish that what would be the, that tip that you could give to our listeners? So I have a quick one. I don't know that it's necessarily that I would do this differently, but one thing is if you do get a postdoc, one really important thing for your future success, if you move on to a faculty position or whatever, um, is you want to come to an agreement early on about um, like publications and data use once you leave that institution. And I know it may seem kind of um, silly, but just trying to get an understanding of, will you be able to use the data? What are the expectations for adding people to those papers and things like that? Because I know for me, starting my faculty position where my time for research is less because of the teaching and service obligations, um, those publications from my postdoc are, are and have been really critical for my success early on in my faculty position. Uh, that's great advice. Um, this is uh, Nicole again. Uh, in addition to that, I would say take advantage of whatever the institution offers when you're there. So a lot of larger research institutions will offer things like grant training workshops or um, they might have the opportunity to work with what's called pre in the United States. A lot of the times what's called pre award, which is where you identify, they can help you identify a small grant that might make sense for you to apply to. And then they can help you walk through the process of preparing an application for the first time. A lot of the time you don't really have a choice and they make you work with them because whatever you agree to in the grant, if you're funded, the university's on the hook for doing that. Um, but working with them is going to be a, a way to, to kind of get your feet wet with maybe some of these skills that you haven't really developed as a doctoral student. Um, I even did some teaching and uh, kind of like culturally responsive pedagogy sort of workshops while I was at Michigan because they were available and there wasn't going to be another time when I would just have this kind of almost unlimited time to do whatever I wanted in professional development. So um, I would say do as many of those as you're interested in while you can, because it gets harder once you have a faculty job. Plus, they sometimes give you lunch. So lunch is good. Um, I would say, and this actually goes for your PhD, doing your PhD and master's as well, but definitely in your postdoc, you're allowed to say no. Um, you're allowed to say no to the additional projects. You're allowed to form your line and um a lot of times we get the, oh, but this will look good on your CV. Um, and sometimes that's true and you should say yes, but it's okay if it's not true for you. And you it's not going to, one no is not going to ruin your career and it may save your mental health. So that would be mine. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for your time. Panelists, you were excellent. Attendees, thank you so much for being here. I think Rosa was going to share her screen, or did we want to get a group picture real quick before we wrap up? Because it is noon. Actually, it's 12.01, so I apologize. We're keeping you an extra minute. Yeah, please take the... You are muted, Rosa. Uh, you hear me now? You're good. Yeah, okay. Uh, so let's take a group picture please. Alex, you do it or? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure. All right, everybody on the count of three, smile. I'm gonna take a screenshot. I think it's command shift four. 
Ready, one, two, three. Hold on, keep smiling, keep smiling. Boom, got it. Okay, uh, last but not the least, we just would like to um, give you some, some information about next international uh, symposium of adapted physical activity, which is going to be in New Zealand. Uh, the last one on 2021, it was uh, online. The first online ISAPA had, uh, was held by Uvascular University from Finland. And we had the first student uh, chair event on 2021. And there it was important because then the student uh, representation uh, had a new formation, which now we call it NESAPA. So if you would like to join us, please scan the QR code or go to a link in the chat. I guess Alex is just putting but to join us on Slack platform. Uh, time to time, we are sharing some announcements and you can, all, uh, you can also sometimes see some postdoc opportunities there. So you can join us and hopefully we will see you uh, in Isapa, New Zealand. And we just want to say thank you for being here, all the panelists and uh, the audience. Thanks a lot.